I'll introduce myself as a local whore. So almost everything I eat comes from Alaska. Most of that comes out of my backyard. Um, but because it's no, really hard to grow everything yourself, believe me, I've gonna, tried. It proves the last few years, I've tried to broaden my, my perspective and do more wild foraging. What's Mother Nature already growing for me that I can just eat? Liz, I'll let you. Uh, yeah, I do some wild foraging. I feel like I actually also wild forage in my yard with the volunteers that come up in the spring and things like the dandelion. Um, I like to make some herbal things. I love to eat really well. So a lot of it is like making a salad that has like, I don't know, 20 different types of greens in it. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't know what else to say. I'm permaculture certified. <laughs> And I've lived in Alaska since 1977. I think we should start by talking about weeds because they're so, like in an urban environment, they're, they're so easy to find. Yeah. Right, out, right out your back door, there is so much without even having to like go over to Kincaid and pick nettles or you know, stuff right outside your back door. So I, I do want to, I'm super excited about this. I've never made dandelion root tea before, so yesterday was my first time. And I have, by, happen, by happy happenstance, I used a spice grinder to grind the root. And oh my god, it's so good. <laughs> because in our spice grinder, we grind ginger, cardamom, <laughs> cumin, cinnamon. And all those flavors got infused in this. And it's so good. Would anybody like to smell it? I would. Like yes. Thai dandelion tea? It, yes. This is just roasted dandelion root. So I picked the dandelion roots and maybe. I picked the dandelion roots, I cleaned them, I chopped them, I roasted them, and then when they were dried, I put them in the spice grinder, and then I was expecting it to be like, earthy overtones, but it's really good. <laughs> Tastes like a latte to me. <laughs> oh, anyway, that was like a happy, I don't know, a happy mistake, if you will. But dandelions are so incredible. And by the way, they're super rich in vitamin D, which has been shown to be uh, helpful in fighting off COVID. And over there, I don't know if she smelled it. I'm stuffed up. Oh, don't worry. Okay. Oh, do you want to smell? I'm kind of stuffed up. Okay. okay. <laughs> so you want to be able to smell it. But dandelions are pretty incredible. Like, there's so much you can do with them, and they're everywhere. You just, you have to be a little mindful of where you pick. You probably don't want to pick where somebody might have, like, you know, pesticides and herbicides in that environment. Or close to a road. Or close to a road, right? Well, Those if are... you have a dog, can you, I guess. Okay, here's, here's my thing about that. Okay. I rinse. I don't care anymore. Okay. I mean, at first I was like, oh my God, <laughs> what if the dogs peed on that? And now I'm like, well, what if it rained after the dog peed on it? And you know what? Oh, thank it. you. Good. I'm going to take it inside. <laughs> I'm going to rinse it and then I'm going to enjoy it. And I, but it took me a while to like get up <laughs> to the point where I was comfortable with that. And then I'm like, oh, this is great. So, I mean, Liz, do you have any comments about that? Well, <laughs> yeah, I was over at the Central Lutheran Garden kind of helping myself a little bit yesterday. Like, there's good King Henry over there, and I was having some people over, and I thought, how many different, like, greens can I put into the salad? Um, and they've got a, over there, there's also a ton of sorrel, which I also have in my yard. But, yeah, I was, going through there, I was wondering if a homeless had, you know, just peed on some of the things that I was picking. But I just took them home and rinsed them. I mean, I, I, I put them in water, you know, and swished them around and then put them in a lettuce spinner. And I felt very comfortable. <laughs> and the urine is, you know, uh, what do you call it? What do you call it? Ammonia. Yeah, but it is sterile. Uh, sterile. sterile. That's the word I'm looking yeah. for. But I was going to say also, on top of what Christy is saying, if you want to make something medicinal from dandelion um, or get them out of the soil a lot easier, if you just speak to the dandelion plant, like the energy of dandelion and you just say hey dandelion you know thank you so much i'd like to use you for my you know roasted whatever or in my salad and then you take a pinch and it becomes like it just comes automatic like this after a while though i like pinch in my garden i'm just saying thank you thank you thank you and um it's my belief that you'll get a higher vibration product from it and you'll get a product that is more willing to work with you and your body and so also if you do that with a dandelion, like, may I dig you up because I would like to use your root, and you put your, and you just wait a second, you just feel like a little energetic shift. Just put your uh, spade in, maybe, or even not, if without your spade, take a hold of the bottom of the plant. You'll be amazed how easy it'll come out if you have asked, you know, permission and just express gratitude. 
I have two things to add. So we did a, we taught a permaculture course six, six, seven years ago at the experimental farm out in Palmer. And we, the, the far, the field was not um, farmed and it hadn't been farmed in a few years. And it was full of like two and a half feet tall dandelions. So the class and I took an afternoon and harvested those dandelions, which you want, when you harvest dandelion roots, you want them to be over a year old. Um, and so because it was a field, we literally just zoom right out. Shoot, there was no like grass root holding them in, you know, and and so we filled garbage bagfuls, garbage bagfuls, rinsed them really good, and then put them on the lowest heating set or dehydrator or your oven, and and roasted them, dried them, and then I powdered them in my Vitamix, and I uh, had dandelion tea. So that's that. Now from an Ayurvedic perspective, I'm an Ayurvedic practitioner. Dandelions are bitter. Bitter is one of the six tastes, and it's one of the tastes that pacifies pitta, which the home of pitta is the liver. So it helps to cool the liver, because liver, pitta is like, has the qualities of heat, inflammation, and, um, and can bring up anger, like irritability, things of that nature. And so, so dandelion being bitter cools the liver so brings down inflammation, it cleanses the liver. Um, it has so many wonderful properties with helping with bile, uh, with the release of bile, but it, it um, what else about, about bitter? It's also uh, ha helpful for kapha, which is another, there's three doshas, vata, pitta, kapha, and the bitter taste brings down the kapha, which is mucus, and pitta, which is heat and inflammation. And this is pitta time of year. So we're seeing an increase in pitta, which means an increase in heat, increase in inflammation in people, irritability. Like sometimes people, if they spend a lot of time in the sun, will get irritable. That's the increase in heat. And so cooling foods, cooling herbs, cooling spices are how you can pacify. So the foods we eat pacify those qualities. And, and Ayurveda, a lot like permaculture is a holistic healing modality based on nature and systems thinking. So they're really well aligned with each other. And um, I think that's probably a good thing of, that's a good thing to say. I read a quote recently that said that if dandelions were hard to grow, you would relish every time they stood in the yard. <laughs> And there's so there are weed, right? And so culturally, like I love to tease my son by eating weeds because it grosses him out so much. But there's tons of these weeds that are super healthy for us. Like chickweed. Did you guys know chickweed tea is sold in the stores? I am not kidding. I, I was shocked to find this out because it's got all these helpful benefits for you. But most of us that have gardens, we're like trying to get rid of it. But it actually tastes super good, fresh. Like to me, it's like a zingy, peppery. Salad or yeah. yeah, so I just pick it and I eat it while I'm gardening. But it's fun in a tea. It's got, I think it's got like a mild flavor. It's super easy to make the tea. It's supposedly got all these helpful things for you. You can even make poultices and use it like on your skin. But yeah, I mean it's weed. So contains another really awesome weed. Super medicinal. You can eat the whole, eat the whole thing. Pretty sure. Uh, Poultices, yeah. yeah the raper poultices. Yeah. Draws in infection out of wounds. Yeah. Back to uh, chickweed, I know you have something to say. You can feed it to your chickens. It's really oh, yeah. good for them. I love it. And it's, uh, it's cleansing to the liver. Another. So here's the thing. Springtime is like beginning of pitta time of year. And all those new shoots that come up from nature, all those greens and all those shoots are the perfect antidote to the time of year. So it's like great, it's amazing how nature provides the food at the perfect time of year for where we are. So springtime is the time of year that you would do a liver cleanse, which happens to be all the food, the fresh sprouts that are coming up, the weeds. Or, so if you look at it scientifically, you could assume that we've evolved to <laughs> be what best designed to process the food that's available at the time. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and you can make an elixir too with uh, plantain 
mostly chickweed and dandelion, either by pouring hot water over the three of them, chopping them up and pouring hot water over it and then straining it, or just putting out as like a sun tea. It's a really great spring elixir. You could yeah. do, put it in apple cider vinegar mm -hmm. and just for two weeks, just turn it every in a jar with a lid, pack it, and just turn it every, for two weeks, turn it every day, and then take that apple cider vinegar with dandelion, with chickweed, you can do turmeric, you, there's no end to what you can put in there and make a medicinal tincture to take every day or when you're feeling like you're getting something. And we should mention pineapple weed too, that's another really cool mm -hmm. weed. I love the little flower, it's, you know you know what pineapple weed looks like? Called false chamomile. It, if you taste it, it tastes like pineapple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we should smell have. Like, it smells like pineapple. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's my understanding you can use the whole plant, but I love to have a jar of just the flower buds. I dry them and have them available to me all winter because they add so much flavor. Mm. Like if you drink chaga tea, just, I think it's so much better if you put a little of these pineapple flowers in there because that floweriness, that kind of fruitiness, will just infuse whatever it is that you're drinking. Um, That's awesome. It, it's a super common weed. There midsummer. Go, They're a midsummer weed in your in your grass probably. It's the well, one that has see. like the little yellow flower on the top and the kind of feathery. Kind of looks like this. This, flower. yeah, this actually, uh, it looks like that. And here's a this picture is small, but if you can see the little yellow. Um, can I pass it around? Oh, I always thought that was camel. It is a no, false camel. But it's this is a great down. book too. Yeah, this is by Jones. <laughs> Yeah, that's the book to have for a while, Alaskan wild plants and herbs. It's by Janice Schofield, Discovering Wild Plants. She lived up here in Homer for years and years and years and has come back often to teach. She's moved out of, got, fell in love. Australia? Is New Zealand. New Zealand, yeah. Wow. It's a wonderful book. I mean, it yeah, has every plant cool. in it. That we she also has a small one that's just a, supposedly Alaskan. She has one on just nettles. A yeah. little book on just nettles. And um, this book also has great recipes, as does the nettle book for every imaginable thing yeah, we you talk can about do nettles. with nettles. Ooh, yeah. good nettles one. Nettles are awesome and they're everywhere. And what I learned actually from this book is that a that's wanna, a great book too. If you want to keep harvesting from the same spot, you can cut the top off of the nettle in the spring and it'll just branch out. And so then you, that same plant will keep making nettles for you. You're not supposed to harvest the leaves after it's gone to flower, after it's gone to seed and flower, because then the leaves start to get more oxalates in them. But you've got quite a bit of time, you know, May and June, maybe even July, I don't know, before those seed buds start. And nettles are awesome. There are oh, a lot of different things you can do. Come with on them. over here and see or the nettle. Look, there's a nettle. Oh, okay, I was just looking up at the yeah. From Liz's garden, right? Yeah. That's, look how good that's doing. Yeah, all these have been great. Actually, it's oh, kind of amazing. I've just been watering and, them when I'm yeah, here. Yeah, nettle. And the thing about nettle, too, is uh, you guys think I'm nutty, but if you talk to nettle before you pick it, it will not sting you. That? And if, I mean, I taught these little girls this at the Waldorf School, and they were there were nettles growing amongst raspberries, and these three girls were going in amongst the nettles, just picking the raspberries, not getting stung. Where's the bird? it will not sting you and if it does sting you the best remedy is just to pinch off a leaf smush it up and rub it on the part that is stinging and it'll go away so, I've, I've been taught that you know if you get anything poisonous See, usually the antidote me. is growing <laughs> right around it that's have you been taught that What's as well so like if you if you rub up against something poisonous, some kind of plant, usually the antidote is growing right around it. Oh yeah, I don't know. But look at this. It's not sticking me. Oh. <laughs> if I, I touched I it, would it? Seen that sting plant, me? And I've been trying to identify Alaska nettles and I was like, that can't be a nettle. So I saw them all over the area around here. Yeah. And uh, stinging that was really bad.
Because we have to, they, they will take over the, in the, in the fall when we go back to school, they have taken over the garden usually, so we have to go full of like them. Have, nobody told me about asking permission. They, nettles make a great um, addition to compost. You could probably say exactly what it does, and so does yarrow, and so does uh, comfrey. They can be activators in your compost. And, and you might want to say something. Well, they're all they're all really good accumulators for minerals, so that's why they help your compost. One of the reasons they help compost. Yeah, and that's the great thing about weeds is I don't I'm not even sure it's true. Most of them dynamic accumulators. Yeah. So they're salads or make sun teas or whatever out of them you're getting all those great nutrients. So comfrey is a bioaccumulator so it has a tap root that goes 15 feet down which brings that minerals from that stratosphere up. So this is another thing of what we learned earlier about guilds. This is how one plant can benefit everything growing around it because they because the mycelium will move that around too. So the mycelium move the minerals to the plant. They're the only thing that can actually move minerals. So everybody knows mycelium fungus, right? That's their, throughout throughout our soil, they're the things that are actually they're the miners. They're the only things that can actually move physical minerals. But then the plants grow, take those minerals from the mycelium. There, there's a cooperative life force with them, however you want to describe it, that allows the plants to uptake those minerals. Are you talking about energy, Don? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> um, this is a fun back and forth that Liz and I have always had because Liz is very woo-woo as I describe it, and I'm trying to be more, I'm brought up in the scientific background. It all interchanges, right? It, it, right. The, more, the more I do this, the more I learn that there's... It's all connected. It's all connected, uh, right? Um, we're all connected. They're Everything's energy. My my favorite Radical. proof of this <laughs> is I've been teaching gardening at the Waldorf School now for about 15 years. And so every spring we get together with the kids and plant. And so I've got, been able to go from a class from first grade all the way to eighth grade planting plants. Every year the first grade classroom plants and we move classrooms every year, so it's not the actual building. Every year, the first grade graders' plants grow way better than everyone else's because the energy in first grade is so positive. <laughs> and every year, the eighth grade plants are like, oh, so heavy. The world is just so heavy. So, so yeah, like we'll plant the same day or within a day or two of each other. Same care, same instructors, because these, these eighth graders were first graders. They've learned all this stuff at the same time. You go into the eighth grade class and the plants are this big and they're kind of wilty and struggling. <laughs> and you go into the first grade class and the plants are this tall and ah! Oh, you mean the seedlings that are actually growing in the class? Yeah, we grow. We oh, start. Yeah, we do our starts really in the cl it. classroom so that we because you know, school gets up early in May and so we have to start everything so we can plant the garden before school's out. So yeah, it's just always amazing to me every year. I'm, we should I, probably also put a shout out to Fireweed. Really? Yeah, it's a big makes a big difference. Yeah. When our when our three sisters grows up, the because I'm gonna put a trellis as a moose fence, when the peas and everything grows up, it will one of the many functions of that is um, sound barrier and toxicity and it's a moose fence and it's beautiful and Wait, so you're talking about peas um so we're going to do squash sunflower I mean sunflowers. A, and corn, and we're going to try squash. two different. Then we're going to do peas or beans or cucumber, okay. and then squash and marigolds. Okay, I was going to say another one that I heard was really that was four sisters was bee balm. That oh, bee that's balm right. Yes. I forgot that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you you brought bee balm. You, yeah. We got a bunch. And also, I heard someone wants to be in that bed right down there near the corner where you we're going to have a big wide bed, but then you decided to split it. It wants to be in that end. It's going to be like, whoo. Okay. <laughs> sure. I was going to give that to Yad, who's a refugee family from Nepal. So I may have to switch beds that he had, because I don't know if he'll want bee bomb in, but, you know.
you know, maybe. It'd be crazy not to. Once he has it, yeah. he'll always want it. <laughs> yeah. And it's beautiful, you said. Yeah, it's going to be about this tall. Maybe not this year, but next year. It's going to be about this tall. Well, maybe I'll take that bed and then I'll plant it. Yeah, like at that end. So then also when people go around the corner, and it's, it'll be very stately. I like that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, fireweed. Fire. This is a good time of year to mention fireweed because the young shoots are still coming up and those are the ones that are like the tenderest and the sweetest. But I did just learn you can actually continue to eat fireweed all summer long. The texture just changes. So you might enjoy fireweed this time of year fresh in a salad, but maybe in August you might still enjoy your fireweed, but perhaps, you know, sauteing them lightly first or something like that. I mean, just play with it. And then of course you can use the flowers, eat the flowers as well. But I really appreciate dandelions, fireweed, and plantains, and chickweed because those are like vegetable items. What do plantain look like? Let's look one up for you. They're they're really interesting. They have these broad leaves. You'll recognize it when you see it. They have a single flower that kind of comes up out of the middle. It's everywhere. It yeah, is they're... everywhere. It's all it's called white man's footprint. footprint. And it's funny because the herbs that are medicinal for us are generally the ones that grow up in the like cracks in our cement and whatnot. It's like trying to get our attention, like, eat me, eat me, you need me, you know? And they're, cause they're right there. Yeah, We're like a hosta, a small hosta. Oh, okay. Like Here the seams of the, yeah. And here, um, this is also makes a great salve, like Terry mentioned, if you're trying to draw anything out of your skin. Like if you, yeah. even if you've got a splinter or you're trying to draw out infection or... I've know, got a story. Whatever, it really so if you see out. the little oriental ladies walking around midsummer with a bucket, that's yeah. usually what they're picking. Yeah, you can even, if you're out on the trail and say you got a thorn or something and you don't have tweezers, you can't get it out, you could just chew up some of this in your mouth and just put it over it and then tape over it or something. So I was... Um, I, I was in a remote plantain. 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 in a remote camp with um, taking care of these two little girls. One of them got an abscess, and we weren't anywhere near a dentist. We were remote, and her whole side of her face swelled up. Abscesses can be really dangerous. They can be life-threatening. Well, I went and picked a bunch of plantain. I did what Liz said. I kind of connected with it got the sense that this it was up for the job i had her the little girl she was 10 chew it up wad it up and stick it up there 24 hours later gone oh gone there's actually a story just like that in this book too this, this is my wild foraging book that i've really been enjoying great book it's not alaska specific um, but it's got a ton of good information and good recipes in here and there's a story exactly like that about plantains yeah in here but what I really appreciate about some of these vegetables, they're with us all summer long, and I can eat them all summer long, and that's kind of cool because, you know, I'm trying to eat everything out of Alaska that I possibly can, and, and our garden makes a ton of food, like literally a ton of food. But still, like this time of year, my annuals just aren't quite there yet, but there is so much flipping food. Like everywhere I look now, I see food. It's everywhere. There's Yay. no reason anyone in Anchorage should be hungry, especially in June, because there is food everywhere. You might just have to think about your food a little differently, right? Like my 15 year old son totally grossed out because mom's eating weeds, but the fact is they're really nutritious and they're abundant. Yeah, they're everywhere. Yeah, and back to nettles, um, the best time to eat them is when they're about this tall. And is that what you guys think? Of this tall or shorter? As, as long as you get them before they flower. Yeah, but I think they're more tender if you get them shorter. I agree. And then you can, um, you can also just, if you haven't, created a nettle patch just I just keep mowing mine down just clipping it off and eating it or drying it you know to use later like you can use it in the winter to put in soups if you've dried it or um, you could even blanch it I'm sure so I'm some of the that. uses for nettle um, so you can make nettle pesto which is delish you can do you can um, nettle tea is fabulous for lungs so any respiratory cold nettles are brilliant so dry them and then they become a tea um, I've added them to soups like you can cook them boil them so that the stingers come off and then I use the broth in my, my healing soup that I make and um, and you can also just great you can also do uh, nettles 
like steep it and then spray it on your plants. It's a natural fungicide, I think. You can also put it on your hair and it's good for probably dandruff, dandruff or something because it's got that it's kind of conditioning. Too. conditioning. I mean, that's why Janice Schofield wrote a book on just nettles. Wow. It just goes on and on and on. And I think I'm only mentioning like a quarter of what you can do with nettles. Oh, you're mentioning like even less. Even, even less, less. yeah. And they, they are really are they delicious. Hey, what? And attractors like the, uh, insects? Do they attract beneficial insects? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But they're delicious too. I mean, they're like really good, like a spinach type thing. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, they are the first thing to grow in like a beginning compost pile or a pile, throw up pile leaves out in the backyard. Those will be the first thing to grow in them. So I'm guessing that they're probably a, attracted to the good beneficial insects that you don't see flying around. I was just wondering if cabbage rollers might like it. Oh. <laughs> so they would go to the nettles instead of the <laughs> I know. I know I that's. I haven't had any, but this year, I mean last year, but a lot of people do. Some people will plant like radishes as a sacrificial row to attract pests so they leave the other crops that the farmer or grower really values. And so they kind of, Ellen Vandevies kind of teaches that a little bit. Yeah, we do that with, we used to do that with an eggplant in our greenhouse. We grow one eggplant because the, the first thing that aphids would go for is the eggplant that I know to be a so if I, that way I, I just have to check one plant instead of the whole greenhouse full of plants. And then if I see aphids on that plant, then I know I need to start doing aphid mitigation and spraying plants like with canary, cold water. Uh, the canary, yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, eggplants. So have we hit on all the main, the most abundant weeds, the, the easiest ones for an urban environment? Or are there any more? Probably. I, I'd like to say something, though, about things you could just have come up in your garden year after year, you know, that you can just let the seed. Yeah. Yeah, well, not perennials, but um, oh, reseeding, self-seeding um, things. Like, in right now, I'm, well, for one thing, I have sorrels. Right now, I'm, and of course, chives are coming out. They're, those are perennials. So I can make a salad every day and just go out and get some chives and some um, sorrel. And then I can go to my vegetable beds and I've let all these mustards go to seed. Oh, yeah. And they're already, you know, much bigger than any seeded myself and so I can add those and then you can grow purple orange which is also like this size now and that's coming up and that tastes like spinach um, did you say borage orange oh orange sorry orange. Orange. borage is wonderful and it also too. becomes good in, I mean it's you can also get green orange green and purple um, but that will self seed and um, I have alfalfa that comes up perennially, and I can pick off some of that and put it in. Um, and I have several different mustards. It can, you can just make a great little salad already, you know, or even a couple weeks ago, because these things self-seed, and that's going to come up sooner generally than your seed. Could you share the story you shared yesterday about that? She has a Waldorf daycare right across her street, oh, yeah. and the little kids, the preschoolers. Yeah, they're so adorable. They're called the Pussy Willows, and there's like six of them. <laughs> and they come over to see my garden, like, you know, every season or so. And uh, so they've been several times, and whenever they come, I, I just told them in the beginning, little boys can be different. You might have to tell them every time. But I tell them that every plant in the garden relies on me to keep it safe. And so I tell, because little boys will just walk around and strip a fern, you know, I mean, just it's there. And, um, <laughs> little girls tend to do that less. But anyway, when they do anything in the garden, I've taught them that they need to ask the plant first and thank it, and then they can pinch it. And so they, in every season they come, they get cherries off the cherry tree and all these things, but they always have to ask first and say thank you. Well, in the fall, I was thinking, well, it would be really nice if they came over and sang a lullaby to the gardens to put them to sleep for the winter because they're all into this the little root people and all that in Walder. It's very um, open to um, what we might call mythical beings or nature beings. And uh, so anyway, they uh, they came over and each one of them had actually individually created a song for the garden. Oh, 
But first they sang a lullaby to, like, I have a medicine rail garden, they sang a lullaby to that garden. And then one of them remembered this exquisite crabapple, I have a snowdrift crabapple that had been sick in some way. And she went, the tree! And they all ran over to the tree and put their hands on the tree and then sang the lullaby to the tree. <laughs> but also to each garden, they sang their own song, but their teacher said, we don't have time for each one of you to individually sing your song. So you just all, go ahead, all of you now sing your song. In the tree. So they all, this like cacophony, wow. just sang their individual songs to the tree. And when, I mean, I looked up in that crab apple and I just saw like a, um, it was just full of like, kind of like angelic beings, just bright beings of light while they were singing this to them. And then they went to the front yard and I have like a spiral garden out, out there. And it does, I'm interested in the energy of what gardens can do and be, give to us and what we can contribute to them and the universe. And um, they went out and sang to that garden. And they always have to run through the medicine wheel, the, you know, all around the little circles. And they got out there, they have to run through the spiral. And um, I saw like all these like beings were like dancing around with them. And there were some, there was a, there's a birch tree there that has a side branch and they were sitting up in the side branch like, <laughs> you know, they had, they had like their, I know I'm going to go out totally loony now, but <laughs> they, they had their, um, their little outfits on these beings, you know, like whatever they were, these creature mythical white beings. And they were all having this huge party. They were just like thrilled that these children had been there because you can imagine what kids energy like you know just so light like Don was saying about the first graders and how you have the energy they are in their classroom all the time and how those plants you know everything is energy and those plants would just respond. Energy Bob, energy. <laughs> well from an, in Ayurveda we teach that um, you cook with loving hands. You should cook with loving hands which means like in it with joy and gratitude because that energy is infused into your food and so when you're planting a seed you can do a blessing and infuse it and when you're caring for your starts you can by singing and talking to them you're infusing them with that energy so you're actually giving them additional I guess we could call it, I, I, I want to call it a tool, but it's more than a tool. It's like um, food uh, from us. I mean, and of course we're giving them CO2, which they need and they're giving us oxygen. So there's that exchange. I mean, there's so many sort of stacking functions as to why interacting with your plants and your food is so beneficial for us. Um, you ever had one of Terry's meals, you will do not, not deny. I when I, I I don't always cook this way, but I do cook high vibrationally. Uh, because also we were taught in Ayurveda that um, it's like the the monks or the gurus in India. They have one or two people specifically trained to prepare their food, and it's because it's prepared in a sacred manner for the priests or the monks or whatever. Uh, and it's it's a very real, takes discipline thing, and the food is of a high vibration. And so I, I'm doing that myself on occasion, <laughs> not every day. <laughs> but cooking with loving hands, in a, in joy and gratitude, you can do every day. I just yeah. thought of rose hips. I thought we should do a quick yeah, shout out for rose good hips good for you too. because uh, <laughs> roses grow abundantly in Anchorage. Um, especially along Chester Creek Trail, Campbell Creek Trail, right? And some of those rose hips, there's, there's different kinds of roses that grow in Anchorage, but they're very high in vitamin C and zinc. And there's some kind of Alaskan rose that Sit apparently down. three rose hips have as much vitamin C as like a single orange. And for me, that's huge because we all need our vitamin C, but I don't want to eat an orange that came from Florida. I want to have something from Alaska. Well, rose hips. And they're super flexible. You can do all kinds of things. You can make tea with it. You can make fruit leather. There's just tons and tons of different recipes. Don't eat the seeds, though. I mean, you can eat a fresh rose hip. They're kind of mealy. I don't like the texture. Make sure you spit out the seeds because the seeds have these little barbs on them that can give you problems later. So what's your favorite way to prepare it? My favorite way? Okay, so I go out into Russian Jack, and I harvest high bush cranberries, which put a shout-out to them. They have the highest amount of antioxidants of 
any other berry tested in the state of Alaska. High bush cranberries. Um, so I take my high bush cranberries and I and my rose hips and I freeze them for winter. Because if I get sick during the winter, I'm going to take those cranberries and rose hips. I'm going to make like a really strong tea, and I'm going to drink that tea every day, and it's going to help me get better. So you're not you're not doing anything to the rose hips, but picking them and freezing them. Pick them, wash them. Um, so if they have that little stemmy stem thing from the flower, I'll pick that off, and then I'll I'll freeze them. That's usually so you're what I do. So just making a tea, so you probably don't even pick that little stem thing off. I, really? um, well, I kind of cook them okay. with the cranberries, and then because the cranberries have seeds in them, and you kind of want to take that out. So I like boil them, steep them for like 20 minutes, and then I take like a flat bottom glass and I squish everything. So I'm getting all the juice out. And then I just run it through a strainer to separate out the seeds and all that stuff. Then you sweeten it a little? You know, I just water it down. I really like the natural flavors. Ever, the more local that I've eaten, the less sweetening that I'm adding to my foods. I've but become, if it's close enough to fall and we've just finished make, canning applesauce, we always have a jar full of applesauce tea. That's the other thing I do with my apple. Oh, applesauce tea is so good. Because you get um, my applesauce, the apples are so juicy that I kind of want to separate out the liquid um, because I don't want my applesauce to be runny, soupy. Yeah. And that liquid is so tasty. It is so good. So I just freeze it. I just put it in a jar, put it in the freezer and freeze it. And that's something that I can pull out in the middle of winter if I'm like, oh, I'm not feeling so good. Well, have a taste of fall, right? Here's this stuff that you may, like you, you harvested this thing when it was at the ripe, ripest it's going to be. And then you totally locked in that flavor. I love to freeze my stuff. The only thing that I bother canning is applesauce because it's super easy. Everything else I freeze because I figured out what foods freeze well and what foods don't. And that way I can eat from my garden every day, all winter. There's long. a lot of and I'll just I'll, I'll just add that um, at our plan here is to offer workshops for the season that we're in. So as we get to the fall, we will have workshops on freezing, root cellaring, how do you store these, preserving, dehydrating, canning, like all of that, that's all coming. So. I will tell you, one of, the, one of the keys to our processing is that we, she starts storing as soon as we start harvesting because, again, we grow 2,000 pounds of food. Who here wants to process 2,000 pounds of food in, in one, one weekend, weekend right? <laughs> Nobody. So if she can Smart. do, if you can do 60% of all the processing you're going to do throughout the summer, at, literally as you're cooking dinner, you just cook extra and freeze some of it. Or on the weekend, she'll make a big pot of soup from what's ripe in the, in the garden right now. And that'll go into the freezer. So she's doing a little bit on the weekend while she's gardening. Then, then well, maybe we'll have a workshop huge... earlier then. Yeah. 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 For that. The freezer, so we have this, this small freezer chest, but they're full, and we can't keep eating them. I mean, we 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 don't. We are not like you. We eat other things besides Alaskan. But it's amazing um, um, how much you can freeze. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Well, the risk with freezing is it disappears, right? Just like putting stuff in a cupboard. So uh, you have to you have to be disciplined about yeah, eating it. Yeah. 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 So the leaves, what you said. the leaves and the um, cabbage and etc oh yeah it's amazing I that's what all of my smoothies are made of and uh, the soups and everything I mean and it's I don't can't get rid of it I mean. yeah the so leaves <laughs> leaves you can blanch down they'll take up a lot less space uh -huh. um, blanch and freeze blanch and freeze yeah um, but most of the stuff we don't we've stopped blanching almost everything when we first started they were like oh you have to blanch everything no you don't you have to blanch stuff if you're going to sell it commercially and want to want to store it for uh, like it has to be able to freeze for three years without being damaged. Well, we don't care if it's so you just um, like we well, just, with just leaves. put it in a uh, with leaves we blanch, but yeah, yeah otherwise leaves, we put all we, kinds of leaves like yeah. metal and all that you blanch. Well, um, no, I've been just doing the stuff we grow, so the nettles and stuff I haven't. I've been just eating those fresh. I haven't started putting those by for winter yet. But the annuals that we grow, but, yeah. I'm sure we will now. <laughs> I'm a big fan. All of a sudden, these weeds, man, they're awesome. They do so much for us. There's so many of them. There's no reason anyone in Anchorage should be going hungry. Why do you Spruce call tips. Weeds? 
Spruce so tips. Weeds, you know, why, just, why do we call them weeds? I don't know. They're called weeds because they're plants weeds? that are growing where you didn't want them. That's, oh. that's all a weed is. That's what a weed is. Yeah, yeah that's true. That is a weed. But Unintentional we, plants? I don't if know. If we want them, I mean, if they're part of our lawn now, then we don't have to call them a weed. Can we talk exactly. about spruce Free tips? Food. Yeah, we should totally talk about spruce tips. Free food. Free food. Yeah. Free food. Yeah. I'm zooming in on urban, them. Urban. My favorite thing with spruce tips, so that I mean, they're really good to just. Well, you guys should just pick some, right? Yeah. I mean, you should totally well, pick and eat these. The, 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 these bright green ones. Go ahead and and try it. They're really good. And but my favorite way is to make a tea and then serve it cold, because there's um there's apparently electrolytes in here, uh, but it's super refreshing. They're lemony. Totally, like get up right now and go find yourself one of these and pick it and eat it because they're really good. And you want to get them while they're still closed up. By the time they start to open a little bit, they're kind of past and the texture is not as pleasing. Teresa, a tree man just went by. He waved. Oh, yay! They're going to keep bringing us chips. They're super lemony. I mean, I find them Ooh. lemony. Yeah. And, and I love, I really love iced, <laughs> iced spruce tip water. Mm. So you like do it, boiling water first and then cool it down? There's a couple ways you can do it. I've done it that way, mm -hmm. and that works. I also like to just gather a bunch of these things. Let me rephrase that. I'm totally with Liz on asking for permission and telling the plant what you're going to do and being respectful, especially these spruce tips, because these don't, I don't think they grow back in the same place every year. Because I've gone back to the same tree that I've harvested from before, and I'm like, rather, because it's usually like three fingers that come out. Like, if you take a close, closer look, you'll see like, here's three fingers, right? Yeah. Well, I go to a tree that I know I've harvested from before, and I'm like, oh, there's two fingers there now. There's not three. So let's be, you know, mindful and respectful of that. Thank you. Yeah, but that Thank brings you. up the subject, too, of when you do harvest wild things, don't just take everything off of right. one plant or one area. Try to move around, you know, and right. you think it, t it doesn't take a lot of time to ask permission. Just, hey, can I have some of you? And you just, you feel so and you're like, yeah, okay. You, but yeah, throw yeah, a bunch yeah, in thank it. You. Throw like a um, punch in a jar. So like one third cup spruce tips or two thirds cup water. This put it in the sun and it looks cool. And it tastes like a day and it tastes delicious. And it's a wonderful, like, I like to set that up I'm going to garden over the weekend because I know I'm going to be hot and sweaty and tired. I want something that like tastes really good and, and replenishes me while I'm working. And oh yeah, you, you put that water over ice and it's so good. It's also really high in vitamin C too. And you can pickle them. Spruce make a really lovely pickle as well. Mm. It mm. seems like with the COVID that um, vitamin C and the, the rose hips yeah. is actually perfect because they're telling us to and don't forget about vitamin D. Don't forget about the dandelions because vitamin D. Their dandelions are high in vitamin D, and vitamin D apparently is supposed to help with COVID. Yeah, vitamin. And don't forget with um, the dandelion blossoms are really fun to eat and cook with, and they look really nice. But you have to harvest them when the sun's out, because otherwise the blossoms close up. Yes. And then you need to actually like do something with them pretty quick because they'll start to slowly close up after you harvest them. What do you do with the blossoms? You can fry them in butter and eat them straight up. I like them in my stir fries. I put them in pancakes. There's a recipe in here for dandelion pancakes. I tried it yesterday and it was awesome. Oh. <laughs> my mother-in-law batter fries in there. Yeah. So just Tempura. like, like a, just a general wow. batter, nothing special, just a, like a Lamb's quarter, yeah. It tastes like spinach, delicious. It's yeah. part of the quinoa family. Yeah. Didn't know that until I yeah. talked to these guys. And that will come up in your garden every spring too. I have a bunch of seed that I saved like a couple of years ago. If anyone wants to try, it's a weed that people try to like, you know, ah, but it's actually edible like spinach, but it's also in the quinoa family. So, so the first colonists that came in Palmer a hundred years ago, they were using, that's how I found out about when we were doing the Eat Local for a year, about lamb's quarter, they would take the seed and turn it into flour. And that's how they, that was their flour or their grain that they used a hundred years ago here. And I have seed if you want to try it, grow some weeds. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, um, Fiddlehead 
pose we didn't mention. It's really hard for me to pinch the top off of Fiddlehead because they're so beautiful. But, you I know, think you they're harder to find in Anchorage, though. Not unless you're at her house. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. I'm in the woods right down below Chester Creek. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are they yeah. Wild? Oh, yeah. And you can transplant them in your garden and they're gorgeous, but um, it's hard for me to pinch the tops off. But because then they're never going to do that beautiful thing of unfurling. <laughs> but they make a great sauteed vegetable. But if they're a they're a if they're a healthy perennial, you could take the first flush of tops and like asparagus, they'll just send up more. Right, that's true, Don. Thank you for that scientific perspective. It's not so scientific. There's it's, it's, uh, ostrich fern. Yeah. What is is that? Um, can you eat that? Part? Yeah, is that's it all good. the fiddleheads? No, you can just eat. Well, it's still got to be. It's got to be curly. Yeah, right. but any fern? That's it. Yeah, all the ferns that grow wild up here are edible. Ah, oh, did not know that. Yeah, the, there's two. There's two kinds. It's there's ostrich kinds. and what's the other one? There are two kinds. I think they are both edible. There's that little yeah. short one. Uh, right, there's a short one and the giant one, basically. And then there's the other one that stands up better, like in, in rain, but I don't know what it's called. That's the ostrich. No, no. We get the them. ostrich is the really tall one that comes up like. Yeah, this. we get them like. But there's nine one that's feet tall at a cabin. Tall, that has much stronger stems oh, okay. and won't fall. Yeah, they're in the woods right below the house. Any other ones oh, that we I missed? I was just looking. Oh, um, love it. You're not going to eat a ton of it at once, but it comes up early too, and it's great in any salad. It's just another thing you can put in that has like, like a, a wild celery. Yeah, exactly. And put a little more spunk than celery, but a really fascinating, bright, wonderful flavor in salads. And I, I'm sure it's got medicinal properties. I don't know what those are. Very, very hearty. I mean, all those ones are planted in central. Isn't that what you gave me over here? That's an angelica. Oh. Which wants to be in this plot right here. This, this Japanese side. character? Yeah. Say? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. um, angelica wants yeah, to I'm say. Sorry, she got up like, I mean, it was way overhead in the central Way up overhead. It was spinning around. Do you think that they spread? No. But they don't spread in a bad way. You know how you find one here? See if there's anything else in here. Oh, I have a friend too that takes the rose petals, and she's from Iran, and she makes these wonderful salads with like every herb in it. Like she's got dill, she's got saltzer, she's got basil, she's got mint, she's got all these things. She massages it all up with a little bit of olive oil with greens, and then she sprinkles rose petals on top. It's so good because you get that little flavor of the roses. It's like a divine salad. Rose is an alternative, so it's a tridoshic. It's good for all three doshas, and an alternative is um, good for the blood. It's antimicrobial, so um, beneficial for you. Take it's cooling too. Like rose tea is cooling when you're uh, like this time of year. You know. Well, I think we're at close to one o'clock. Yep. Thank you so much. Go home and yeah. eat some weeds. Yeah, <laughs> thank awesome. you everybody for everything everybody shared because I learned some things too. I'm going to turn this off.